today by professor at Princeton University Creative Writing, Sasha Heman. Um, how are you, sir? I'm well, thank you. How are you? I'm, I'm doing good, too. You know, it's Friday, you know, here in the, uh, you know, in the metaverse, you know, everything is, you know, everything is good. You know, like um, it, it doesn't get too cold here, even though I, I don't know how much you actually follow the whole crypto thing, but we're in the midst of a massive crash right now. Yeah, um, no, yeah, yeah. Do, do you follow crypto at all? Are you at all I mean, involved? Not in particular, but in general, I, I do have, um, I've received the news, if you wish, but not as a crypto uh, investor. Right, right, right. So yeah, yeah, the news is everywhere and uh, we're in the midst of a crash. We had a crash last month, we were falling, but then today again, it like seemed like it had stabilized over the last few weeks and then today again, boom. But in any case, we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about you. So. Can you tell me a little bit about, um, cause you do something that I've always been passionate about trying, about doing, even though I have done it professionally as a writer, you know, written TV shows and, and, and stuff like that. Um, but the process of writing is such a, um, an intense process. And I was reading, um, your article in the, um, in the New Yorker and, it got me, one of the things that you said got me really strong in my head that before you joined the collective of the pit, and I'm sure we'll get into that in more detail, your entire writing experience had been extremely isolated and 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 very closed off from feedback or or, or anything. And I I understand that as almost like a wish fulfillment that I wish I I I had something that insulated. Can can you tell me a little bit about how you sort of found that groove for yourself as a writer? Well, I'm primarily a fiction writer to, to this day. Um, before I started writing for film and television, I was exclusively, um, well, not just a fiction writer, I wrote nonfiction and other things, but I was, uh, uh, exclusively, uh, um, I, let's say, a, a literary writer, which means that I spent a lot of time in my head and uh, thinking up things and, and finding ways to say what I say, because I grew up in Bosnia and the way back. Mm. Um, uh, I came to the United States about 30 years ago, actually almost exactly 30 years ago, but we didn't have creative writing programs or workshops and the whole idea of um, sharing your writing with other people for feedback and then building on that and all that was very common in this country, obviously, was totally alien when I was starting as a writer. So my usual writing practice when I write uh, fiction or literary work is I just lock myself in the office and then I write <laughs> and then I walk around the world with that thing in my head for days and months and years and then thinking about it. And then eventually when I have something to show to other people, I show it to them, but that's not necessarily part of the process, right? Because I trained myself as a word to do everything um, all the way to the near end of it. Yeah. And as you know, film and television are inherently collaborative arts. And so once I started writing uh, for film with other people, it wasn't just that there were other people in the room thinking up things, sharing thoughts, and I could not just be in my head, right? Because I had to be with other people. But also there's this whole organism that is um, a filmmaking or, or television show making operation that you you and then eventually you meet i meet just about everyone from the prop guy to the people who are reading the lines that i've written and so the whole process is is externalized as it were from the very beginning as opposed to the process that i was used to where it was all happening internally and only when i was sufficiently ready would i show it to the world and so this kind of redirection um, well, for one thing, it's more fun <laughs> in many ways because you spend time with other people. I do like people generally. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, and particularly with people that I'm working with, Lana Wachowski and David Mitchell, who have become close and dear friends. I would just would sit in the room with them in silence if I had to, just to be with them. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I saw the music video that you put together um, and it, you know, I noticed, I go, oh my God, you know, there's the, the creator of the matrix inside that video, you know? So uh, it, it was, you know, very cool. So let me ask you one question. Did you, when you grew up, were you um, educated from a young age in English? Were you always writing your creative work in English or, or were you writing in Bosnian? 
Oh, you... I, I was writing in Bosnia. I was I did take English courses and classes, and uh, you know, I listened to a lot of music. And and movies were not dubbed, so we could hear <coughs> subtitles and see what people or hear what people say. Um, but I was writing and operating in my native language, which is which is Bosnian. And so I, I came to the United States um, when I was 27 or so as a published um, journalist and had also published some literary works already. So I was working in my native language. And, what, what, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, I just that I had to switch after I came here because um, I came here at the time of the war in Bosnia and it was at the time it was clear that I would not be able to go back. So I had to decide to enable myself to write in English. Which yeah, I, I actually, not that this is related to this conversation at all, but because um, I've actually uh, been uh, to the former, when I was there, it was still known as Yugoslavia. Right. Um, I was quite young and um, my mom uh, was kind of obsessed because there was a apparition, a very famous apparition of the Virgin Mary yeah. In Yugoslavia, in a city called Medjugorje. Medjugorje, um, yes. That's yeah. actually in Bosnia, yes, yeah. Yeah, up in the mountains. Did, did you know about that growing up? Like, was that part of, the, like, 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 was that kind of talked about at all? Like, the, Yeah, um, it was. It, it was well known. Yeah, um, that it was, well, what they would, the, the euphemism they would use now is controversial. Right. The, the church had never quite, you know, um, approved it. And there was also, there were communists were in power. So it was a sort of a tricky situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't come from a religious family, so we had no, uh, my immediate family is not religious. We had no immediate interest, but it was down the road from where I grew up. Oh, really? It was that close? Because like, when no, I went there, I remember. Know, but it was like, you know, I don't know, 150 miles. So it was, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it, it was way up in the mountains, from what I remember. Yeah. It was like way, way, way up in the mountains. But yes. Yeah, so. Um, so so your, your, your novel that you wrote in 2002, Nowhere Man, was the original transcript of that in Bosnian, or was that already when you had transferred over into English? It was English, yes. That was my second book, and um, I've been writing in English and publishing novels and other literary works since 2000. Wow, that's amazing. So how did you, because I grew up speaking Spanish, right? So I'm, I'm um, Spanish is my first language. And then when I was very young, I learned English, and now I can barely remember my Spanish. So like, how, how did you manage to, to do you know, because writing a novel is like the most extreme feat of words, you know, yeah. and to pick up an entirely new language and construct an entire novel and a novel that's incredibly well regarded and well respected. I mean, is there some kind of weird genius autism going on in your brain with language or something? Is this do you speak other languages as well? Um, not fluently. I know a little bit of French and Ukrainian um, and also the the official language of Yugoslavia was known as Serbo-Croatian, right? Yes. Which is kind of a hybrid language that was um, used in, you know, media and schools. But once the country fell apart, that each of the independent country that countries that came out of it established its own language, which is very much like Serbo-Croatian, grammatically otherwise. So by default, I speak all of those languages, right? Like yeah, that's cool. In Croatian, in Serbian, and Montenegro. But I'm not... I'm not multilingual and as much as I would like to be. Yeah, I honestly don't know exactly how it happened. Um, you know, I, I always want to talk, talk to a psycholinguist. I, I <laughs> knew English well enough to uh, to communicate when I came here and get a job. My first legal job was working for Greenpeace, canvassing door to door. Oh wow! So I had to talk to a lot of people. Um, but writing, as you suggested, is an entirely different operation, particularly writing a novel. You cannot, you know, use your hands and wait for the other person to help you with the word that you can't remember and, you know, all that. So I had to be in full control of language. And I decided to give myself a kind of an arbitrary deadline to enable myself to write in English in five years. So oh, wow. I came in 92 and then I was, I wanted to be able to write a publishable story by 97. But for one reason or another, I wrote a publishable story in, in 95 after three years. Um, I, I decided to enable myself and the primary mode of, uh, of enabling myself was to read a lot. So I read and went to grad school in English primarily to read. And so I read and read and read and underlined words that I didn't know and 
uh, combed to dictionaries and you know wrote words on little note cards and then had to look them up look them up over and over again until I remember them. And it's also writing, as any child really knows, writing in itself is a is a way of learning language because there's a way the kind of language you learn when you speak and interact with people orally and there's also kind of language that you use when you write when you have time to dig deep as it were in your linguistic mind to get the words so the more i wrote the better i was at using the language for writing yeah that's that's um that's astounding and and did you have because it it really captured me when you said that your writing process was extremely uh, personal when you were learning how to write did you have any kind of outside metric that let you know, okay, I'm, I'm really making progress, I'm ready to roll, or, or no, was I, it... I, I, I was preparing myself, and then a couple of years earlier than I had planned, I decided to write a story in English. And so I did, and the story got published. Um, but I, I don't remember, I wasn't trying out a page and showing it to people. I would just, just sit down and wrote a story. And, uh, and it was so strange because... I, at least once when I was writing that first story, I used a word that I was not sure was the right word. That is, I didn't really know what it meant, but I right. used it. So I had to look up the word that I was using in the dictionary, and it was the right word. Right. And, and to me, that suggests, which is the case, really, that your language is in your subconscious mind, right? And so you, I don't, just like you don't have to translate when you speak, I don't have to translate in my native language. And if you speak a foreign language, you struggle because you, you speak more slowly and make mistakes, but partly because there's a delay between the thought and execution because sure. you effectively translate. For whatever reason, in those few years when I was enabling myself to use English, it invaded and uh, entered my, my subconscious mind. So my subconscious mind knew the word, but my conscious mind didn't in that particular instance. And that, that aligned with... Um, the other experience where I was remembering things from my previous life, which was entirely in Bosnia, obviously, I was remembering um, things and recalling things in English. And right. even would notice that in my dreams, people who were not supposed to be speaking English were speaking English around the time. And so to me, that means that my subconscious mind was inundated with, with English language. And, and that's where it is now. So that's why I can write in English without translating. That's amazing. So this is in the mid to late 90s. In 1999, which is by, considered by many like the, one of the greatest years in cinematic history, um, what I consider to be potentially the greatest work of art, or at least the most important work of art, and I could debate this all day with a bunch of people. I, I, I have a pretty good art history background that in 1999, the most important work of art may be ever created by mankind comes out in the form of a movie called The Matrix. Um, did you, um, what was your experience the first time that you watched it? Because my experience was very strange, um, but it's also very special to me because I didn't know anything about it, you know, when I watched it. What, what was it like for you? Well, I, I knew about the Wachowskis because I had seen Bound, the film, Bound. Bound, yes, yeah. yes. And I was, and I saw it because I was, I had no money. I was working for, um, I was thinking it was a graduate school. And so I would go to this place in Chicago in Rogers Park and play chess with guys. Oh, I um, love chess. It was the cheapest form of entertainment. And that, that cafe was next door to a movie theater. I was hanging out with these people and they, they, Bound was playing. And one of them said, you should see this. And I have this local loyalty tendency. I like to like um, place where I live and look for good things there. So out of this kind of knee-jerk local loyalty, I went to see Bound and I loved it. Yeah, it was excellent. So when, when The Matrix came out, right, I went to see The Matrix because of the Wachowskis. I had no sure. idea. Like somehow the advertising didn't catch me. I really hadn't, I didn't know what the movie was about. I hadn't read much about it. I could see it was playing in many places, but so I went to see The Matrix and I mean, it blows your mind Whenever, however you get to it, but I would. Yeah. Use, I love Bound, and I use it in my classes often. Oh, really? But, uh, it was it, the Matrix so different from Bound. I mean, visually and sort of the the world building. Obviously, there are many similarities, thematic and others. We can talk about it too. But it was the, the Matrix was nothing when that Obsidian, you know, code shows up at the beginning and 
Sure. It is just mind blowing. And so I remember that it's one of my great film experiences, right? Of, and I grew up by a movie theater and was going to see movies by myself when I was seven. Or so, and so I cherish this as part of my human experience of, of my cultural experience of sitting alone in the dark and watching the screen and amazing things happen. And so The Matrix is one of the most amazing film experiences I've, I've, I've ever had. It's a physical experience. Yeah, I, yeah. The excitement of being exposed to that and trying to figure out what in God's name is going on here and how did they make this and so on. It was yeah. amazing. Yeah, for me, when I when I watched it, I watched it at the um, at the Lincoln Center Cinema in uh, in Manhattan. And... Uh, I remember watching the movie and saying, okay, this is a great movie. This is cool. This is fun, fun action movie, interesting. But then I'll never forget that on the cab, on the way home, I was driving in the cab and one of my buddies who went to go see the movie was with me and we looked at each other and we said, everything is different now. Like we, like our, our perception of the world is different. Yes. You know? and, and that to me, you know, and then after that, I kept digging into the movie and like, you know, it, it for, for a little while, it, it was driving most of the philosophical conversation in Manhattan, like at pretty serious circles, you know, the concept of the red pill and the blue pill and, and all of these deep kind of uh, concepts about control and willpower and all of these incredibly deep notions were born out of this, you know, uh, piece of art. You know, the, and not to mention from a technical perspective, because film is a very technical art form, from a technical perspective, it completely rewrote the entire book that even to this day, it's very difficult to watch an action movie that's like 17 layers detached from the Matrix and not see its influence on it. You know, it, it, it it's quite astounding. So was the first time that you got... Um, a chance to interact with Lana and, and Lily was it when you got brought on to Sense Eight? Was that like, or, or did you already like meet them prior to that? No, we were already friends. Um, uh, in two thousand nine, I believe they were um, developing a project called CN9, and uh, and the project was um, what they were doing. They were interviewing people um, because the premise of the project was to. Imagine what the Bush years would look like uh, a couple of generations later. Mm -hmm. And so they sort of be, it would have been a pseudo documentary where people 80 years in 2089, right, would be uh, reflecting upon the Bush years and what happened in Iraq uh, with a kind of like historians. And they would have been digital historians because all of our devices would have been, you know, uh, matter for archaeologists or digiologists of that time to look at that. And so they were trying to develop this project as part of it. They were talking to people who they thought had to say things about the Bush years and, and war in Iraq. And so they would bring them to their studio in Chicago. And this included Ariana Huffington and Cornell West and um, mm. uh, Jesse Ventura, the governor of, of Minnesota and, and you know, the ex wrestler who yes. was anti-war and many other people. And someone had gave them a book of mine that I wrote uh, it was published in 2008, The Lazarus yeah. Project. The Lazarus Project, yes. Engages with the issue of the war in Iraq and those things. And so they liked the book, so they invited me to interview me for that, to talk about it. Um, Interesting. Thing. And so, as you can see, I have no trouble talking. Right. And, uh, so I was invited to have this lovely day-long interview, which they shot, and they also dressed me up. And they, at the end of each interview, I had to we had to pretend to be those future historians. So they dressed mm -hmm. me up as someone who looks like <laughs> meant little lights along my bald skull. Oh, and nice. A trippy shirt with a with a pendant with a, a kind of a green stone. I looked like Isaac Hayes. <laughs> and it was it was I was very handsome too. And so I like that. And so we became friends quickly after that. That's and excellent. their studio was a couple of blocks away from where I lived in Chicago. And then we started spending time together and I knew this. I know that their family very well, with the parents and other sisters and the whole crew. And so then, when uh, when they were working and preparing uh, Cloud Atlas, right? Mm -hmm. Excellent. When we were writing, I talked them into letting me sit in on the whole process. Oh and wow! Let me report about it for the New Yorker. 
Oh, excellent. And as you well know, they never did any publicity for The Matrix, and they seldom get interviews, and there are really no articles about them. Right. And, and they, they trusted me as a friend, and, uh, and I talked, and the New Yorker editors were beside themselves with the possibility. So I, I, I was, you know, there, um, the fly on the wall while they were making Cloud Atlas from the script stage and the financing stage to the shoot and, and, uh, and even a little bit of post-production. And I wrote a piece about it for the New Yorker. Um, and so then this is important because the third um, person in the pit, the three-part pit, the pit is in some ways bigger, uh, David Mitchell, it's his novel, David Mitchell's Wall of Cloud Atlas. This is, mm -hmm. I had met David before, but when we went to shoot in Berlin, we spent time together. He was there too. Uh, a couple of weeks and so we became friends there mm -hmm. so then after the first season of sensate lily dropped out and uh, lana invited david and me to contribute uh, in the writer's room and we we're credited as consultants and then when um, we were supposed to write the third season but then the show was cancelled so we wrote a finale instead to to wrap it up yeah yeah no no that that was a touching story like how the finale was uh it was a you know bittersweet you know moment because this you know the show got canceled but you guys all came together uh, for the for the finale. Um, how how was? Because this is only for me as like a film nut, somebody who's worked in the industry and and admire their work so much. In terms of that kind of you know, it's always been a mystery in my head how Lana and Lily would separate the responsibilities of, of filmmaking, you know, because like you said, they don't really give a lot of interviews. Um, and when you look at the, the first three matrix movies, um, you know, every, you know, this has been said a thousand times. I'm not touching any new ground here, but every single scene is so meticulous and the framing is so absolutely beautiful. And typically when you have a duo doing, uh, you know, directing like the Coen brothers, for example, they tend to kind of separate the responsibilities. Like one touches the technical side and one is more focused on the actors. Was that the case with the Wachowskis or, or, or no. were they more cross pollinating? They did everything together from the conception to the um, storyboarding to everything. And I mean, people have noticed this before, but they could, and I've seen it too. They would be sitting uh, during the shoot and you know um, shooting the scene and watching the things at, at the monitor, how the actors performing or whatever, and then they would not talk. They would just get up and split and go and talk to. One would talk to one actor, another one to another actor, or one of them talk to DP, another one would talk to someone else, because it, it looks like magic. So they had a telepathic co um, communication. But when I asked them about it. They said, well, we spend so much time talking about it and preparing that we don't have to consult. It's all already all worked out with them together. And they had been doing that since the age of when they were little kids, when they were, I think, Lana was 10 and Lily's a little younger. They were a 350 page game because they didn't think that. that um, they wrote a game? Brackets. They wrote a game. Oh, like, wow. A la Dungeons and Dragons. That was a little too simple for them. So they wrote a game. Was that was that ever published? Is that ever? No, no, I think I've never seen it, but it does exist. I mean, people, a lot of people remember it. But they wrote a game because they devised their own rules. You can see how the connection with the Matrix for the yeah, game, yeah, especially with the new yeah. Matrix, right? And so they devised their own rules and their their own. And this was, you know, like Dungeons and Dragons, not a um, a computer game or a video game. Anyway, they, they when they were working together, they were they were, they were um, one mind with two bodies, really. And, and back in these early days when you were working, um, when you were kind of uh, fly on the wall for Cloud Atlas and, and then evolving into working on Sensei, uh, did they whisper thoughts about what a new Matrix movie would look like? Was that something that, you know, some, you know, maybe somebody smokes and joined and they start talking about it? Or, or was the Matrix kind of like something that everybody agrees doesn't get talked about? It wasn't they agreed. It's just they. Um, I can't remember if I ever I explicitly asked them if they would do another one, but it was clear that they wouldn't. That at that time they had no interest in doing that. They moved on to other things, and they were not into any kind of franchise model or anything like that. They had other things to do. 
And so I never expected that Lana and Lily or one or the other or both of them would do the Matrix, right? They just happened. Um, yeah. At some point, Lana was ready to return to it. Um, as far as I know, I, I know that she asked Lily. Lily didn't want to do it. And so Lana called David and me to work on the story and the script. Which is awesome. Uh, um, there's there's this one, um, There's a, I mean, there's many great scenes, but there's one in scene that stands out uh, so much. And there's one particular line that, I, that that's haunting me, uh, you know, since I watched it, which is, um, when Groff says, you know, um, um, I quit, uh, I quit calling smoking a habit and now it's just a guilty pleasure. Um, <laughs> it, 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 and in that, in that scene, he, he says this story about how Warner brothers is going to do it with, with or without Keanu or with or without Neo, yeah. uh, or Thomas Anderson. Um, so he better get on the boat or they're going to make it without him. Was that a kind of a hint to the real world that you know Warner Brothers was wanted to make the movie and it was happening with or without uh, Wachowski uh, involvement? Well, I mean, I, I don't, I don't. I, to this day, I'll tell you this: I've never met anyone from Warner Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> no. That's a great answer. That's a great yes, answer. <laughs> no, I, I don't know. I mean, because Lana was always dealing with them and the producers and James McPhee, right? The writers yeah. are relatively unimportant in the process. And also there's no reason for us to talk to them, but also Lana protected us from dealing with the suits. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of a privileged situation. Um, but I do know that there were um, ideas and there were script versions for the possible, you know, uh, continuation because Warner Brothers owns the intellectual property, right? Sure, so sure, they, they yeah. couldn't make it without, of course, it's they could have made it with Lana and Lily. One no of the problem. biggest movie franchises in the history of humanity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. And so, and so there were some attempts, but honestly, I do not know how far they went and why they were not made and what exactly happened other than kind of obvious thing that it's so uh, they, the, the whole world of the Matrix, the trilogy, came out of the Wachowskis, and just there's just no one liked them, of quite course. simply, right? So the only people who could make another one would, were the two of them, or at least one of them now. And so um, it, I don't think that occasionally, as far as I know, they would ask Lana if she wanted to do it, Lana and Lily, and they would say no, and then, you know, nothing would happen. Yeah. So it, 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 it was... Um, the reason it was made, it was not because of Warner Brothers pre pressure, but because Lana decided she wanted to do it, and then she did. That's awesome. Yeah, because, you know, um, obviously, after you've seen the first three movies, you know, maybe a hundred times each, it's like it goes beyond movie, right? It's like some other thing, right? It's kind of like Star Wars and stuff like that. Yeah. So when I was watching it for the first time, um, that scene stuck out. First of all, it's a great scene because you have Thomas Anderson's uh, business partner who's kind of like the you know the you know like the money guy like in the operation obviously with hints uh, towards agent Smith you know reciting his very words when you first see him a statue of agent Smith in the background I mean it was so it was intense you know it's hard to find another word and then when he gives this dialogue about Warner Brothers, you're like, whoa, whoa, and like this, this just became so real, you know, because like in the last three movies, you know, Warner Brothers was never even like a thought in the mind. It was such a, a kind of a agnostic universe, you know, um, and then it just it, it got so it got focused into reality so quickly. Were, is this something that you guys um, that particular scene? Was that something that you touched or? Um, what, was the script pretty blank when you got into the project or, or, or was there already kind of a skeleton? When, what, when we got into it, David and I, I mean, Lana had the opening scene in her mind and the premise of, you know, that um, um, Neo and Trinity want to get back together and the, the, the story of the movie is they're getting back together. That was the idea and resurrecting as a couple and, and resurrected by love as it were. But beyond that, there were no, um, there was no outline of the story, right? Mm -hmm. So, and, and other than the opening scene and that premise, as far as I remember, it could be that Lana was had more. I mean, it could, it, she did have more ideas, and she told them, told us that is. But when we um, agreed and started working, 
this is what we ha had to start with. And then we we wrote the first draft of the script in Inchidoni um, and West Cork Island, where David lives. And so I remember this this hotel, um, not uh, around Christmas time, with you know Irish Sea and everything, sitting in the conference room, looking out at the waves and starting to talk about what could be happening the whole thing, imagining the whole thing, what is how the, how the um, the matrix universe evolved, what happened in the real world and what happened in the in the matrix, right? What shape does the matrix have now? How does yeah. it work? What is ha what is happening? What happened after Zion? What happened with Zion, right? After sure. the invasion of Zion was ended at the end of the, the third um, part of the trilogy, right? And so we had to work out all these details. And I mean, it doesn't, it wouldn't surprise you to know that there was so much more of the Matrix world that did not end in the trilogy because Lana and Lily uh, had, I mean, it's such oh. enormous feat of world building. There was so much more that she oh, talked I, about that. I actually, I actually worked, worked, I actually worked um, for Atari. I was a creative director at Atari during uh, the uh, creation of Enter the Matrix which was a video game right. produced by Shiny Studios. And that video game, it, one of the most intense video games made ever, like most ambitious anyway, because it, it literally, scenes would end in the game and then they would start in the movie. Um, mm -hmm. There would be scenes from the Animatrix, which was the collection of, uh, of animations that would play into the game. It was just absolutely incredible, all these things that they were, uh, you know, uh, sort of weaving together, you know? So it, it was like, I mean, back then the Matrix was was true, you know, meta media. It was like all, you know, it was everywhere. I do remember. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The um, the the notion of of um, there's there's one other thing that I definitely want to get into, but the, but the whole notion of Neo being a game designer. Was that something um, that you know Lana had at the very, very beginning? Like, let's let's put Neo's memories <clears throat> and sort of you know encapsulate them in the in the context of a video game. Because um, there's some great scene, like like another wonderful scene in the movie that I just absolutely loved was when all the game designers are talking about what makes the Matrix special, you know, and they're having the same arguments that any creative group would have when you're trying to recreate magic right because there's a lot of there's a lot of pressure on the creator when they have to win the championship again you know it's like that tom brady effect you know and <laughs> and like everybody spitting out like what they thought made the matrix you know great was that pretty much just a reflection of you guys sitting around talking about making the movie well, it, it's a little more complicated than that because in that particular right. scene, and I love that scene too, and we worked on that a lot. And the whole montage, right? That scene that is intercut with um, Neo's life. Yeah. Is what, what what I like about that scene, what we talked about, is that to Neo, that game is extremely personal. It contains his love for Trinity. There's this memory that he can't even identify as, a, as memory right, of his past life. Sure. Right? And so he has an entirely different investment from the, the people in the room who are in the business of making more stuff, right? And making more games and extending this thing that, um, and they don't have a personal investment in that respect. It's not about their life, if you wish, right? And so we wanted to show that contrast uh, in that scene and that whole sequence where Neo's mm. life is not happy because yeah, there's a, yeah. a fundamental ingredient is missing, right? Whereas all these other people, they're younger than you. They're very excited right. about these ideas. They want this. They all want to, you know. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, now I, I get it. Now I get it. Now I get it. Because what you're saying, if I'm understanding you correctly, what you're saying is that all of these people in the game studio are trying to find on the surface what makes the Matrix special. But the intercut of Neo's life because nobody in that scene says the Matrix is about Trinity. Like yeah. the Matrix is about Neo's love for Trinity. Like that's what the Matrix is about. They can't see that. And not even Neo can say that. That's right, right, right. right. It's a vague memory. He can't quite understand why he 
uh, is so attracted to her, to this woman who comes to, you know, the coffee shop who's married. What is this thing? Yes. So there's this yearning that is subconscious, subliminal even, right? That, that none of those other kids have. Right. And so they're earnest about their excitement in many ways. And they have this, you know, um, busy speech that is common in, in brainstorming in sessions. Whereas to him, it's just yearning, the yearning that he cannot quite pinpoint. And that's that that is um, increased once, you know, Morpheus shows up in his little modal, um, yeah. modal space and starts the whole process again. What? Speaking of the husband, um, for hardcore Matrix lunatics like myself and somebody who's been involved in the movie business, I know very well who Chad Stileski is. <laughs> um, and I also know very well Chad Stileski's history, right? His, um, his incredible story. Um, and he started out as the stunt double of, of Keanu Reeves in the original Matrix movies because Chad is an incredible martial artist, you know, uh, you know, Wu Ping Yang and um, and all these things. Um, and Chad then became an incredible director, right? Directing the John uh, Wick movies, which are masterpieces, in my opinion, in their own right. And really kind of carried like that spirit that Keanu had in The Matrix onto kind of a different, like, you know, reality. Um, and then in this movie, Chad does not do Neo's uh, stunts. But he actually plays Neo's, uh, I'm sorry, he plays Trinity's husband in the movie. And there's even a great fight at the end, you know, spoiler warning, between Neo and, and Chad. Um, I mean, that, that's like as meta and as weird as it gets, uh, you know, was, was that like a known quantity when you guys were writing the script? You were like, you know who we should get to play Chad is Chad. Yes. <laughs> It was because we came up with the name Chad. And so I don't know Chad personally. I met him, you know, in the circle. I'm sure. not, but Lana's obviously close and friends with him. So then we came up, we were looking for the name for the husband that we came up with Chad and Lana said, Chad Stileski. <laughs> That's <laughs> so awesome. That was, yeah, that was, and yeah, yeah. I, I love that. I think, I mean, there's this meta thing instead of the, 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 um, receding mirrors of meaning in the matrix mm. which is what the matrix is really good at but there's also this thing that lana does and the matrix, she gathers people she likes to work with her it's That's a really awesome. simple process and she doesn't always like everyone she works with but with all her subsequent projects she always tries to get all the people she likes to spend time with to uh to work on the movie to see them because there are a couple of things. It's really hard to make movies in any set of circumstances. This was in the, in the middle of a pandemic. You know, we of course, to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pandemic. So to be surrounded with people you like and trust and want to be with goes a long way in such circumstances. But more philosophically, she sees, and I absolutely agree, we talk about this a lot, she sees art as an occasion for collective joy, both the making of art and also creating a space where other people, you, and I, when I watch The Matrix first, can come in and ex get this joy transmitted to them, the joy of creation, the joy wow, of that's interesting. acceleration. And so for this to happen, um, you need to gather people who are capable of that. And they, they, and she learns, we learn who those people are if you do <coughs> make stuff with them. This is why not to, you know, talk about my video in this. But no, no, it's, a, it's a great video. And, and part of the, the part of the pit process is dancing. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. The crew, the, every time we make something together, the pit or um, the movie crew, there's always a party. But the party is not getting drunk or, you know, smashing windows. It is dancing together, which is the, the most basic, most human expression of collective joy. And it's con entirely continuous with Lana and her crew's philosophy of film. So to bring Chad onto the set... Um, the sufficient reason would have been just to have Chad on the set because he's a nice guy. He's very close friends with Keanu, obviously. And and Lana likes him and other people like him. So, yeah, Chad, come along. Let's do stuff together. But, but yeah, but he's also, um, yeah, I mean, it's a really intense thing because he's also Keanu's, like, physical reality. Yeah. You know, like, 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 like when you think about The Matrix and then the fact that in the movie – he's the husband and has what Neil wants. 
it's like you kind of have to know the backstory and you have to yeah. know who that is a little bit. But once you do, you're like, oh, my God. And like I've interviewed Chad. So like the second I saw him, I was like, oh, my God, you know, there he is. One one thing that I have to ask, again, because I'm a little bit of a nerd on this stuff, is I did notice that Wu Ping, who obviously is a very old, you know, he's, you know, I, I believe he's 80 years old at this point. Um, Wu Ping's um, uh, orchestration of the action sequences in the original uh, Matrix and in the uh, next two sequels was so influential that like Quentin Tarantino built Kill Bill completely around the ballet that Wu Ping brings to the table. Now, yeah. was Wu Ping not involved in this one because of age, and he's a little he's more retired nowadays, or, or? Honestly, I, I don't I don't know. That's uh, it's part of the you know pre production that. Um, sure, sure. Uh, it's Lana's domain. We I don't even have input there, and I don't. I haven't heard any stories about that, so I cannot honestly tell you one way or another. No, no worries. It's just, you know, like after I learned of Wu Ping through the Matrix, I saw everything he did. I, I you know, IP man, the guy is just a, a master of master. of that of that art of violence, you know, and like he makes it look the choreography of violence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's absolutely a you know astonishing. So one thing that I'm very curious about because when I, when I watched the video, and I'll put a link to the video in the description because it is actually a very cool video because I was expecting a music video, but what I actually got was this window into a group of people creating together and, and, and having uh, fun together. Oops, sorry, that was my mistake. Sorry about that. Um, what, what I saw was a group of people creating together um, and it's kind of like talk about fly on the wall. It gives you a little bit of a fly on the wall feeling of the creative process. What was this shot during uh, the Matrix, or was this Sensei time? No, actually, it was shot in, in September of last year when I was in Berlin at the very end of the uh, Matrix production. Um, oh, okay. I, was, um, um, I saw this when I saw the final cut. Really, there's some post production details, that were, but that's when I saw it. But we were uh, working on some other uh, ideas. We, we have a couple of things in kind of development. They're spec things, so they sort of, you know, it's it's not pressing. So we take long breaks between sessions. But I was in Berlin, um, and we sat down and we're developing some ideas. And so it was it was work. It was not stage in that sense. We were developing uh, a script cool. idea. But it was not for Matrix or Sensei. Unfortunately, I don't have footage of that. Um, I, I wanted to. Sh I had already made that track, so I wanted to shoot that. And so I asked. In fact, um, the the person, the crew that was shooting the making of John Wick, because uh, Kian was making John Wick four, yeah, uh, in Berlin at the same time, and and the same, and it was also. Um, the same crew that was shooting the making of the Matrix and they're, they're, they're friends, and so they, I asked them to do me a favor and shoot some footage of the pit in session, That's and then cool. the dancing, so I could cut the video from it. And then, as a professor of creative writing at Princeton, um, do you, what, what's kind of your approach to sort of teach the next generation of writers? Uh, creative writing like what are your kind of pillars in 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 the methodology that you impart onto your students i teach creative writing fiction writing and also screenwriting so and um in fiction writing um it is somewhat different because some i get students who read books and so they have kind of experience but they also it is a smaller group than the students who have been exposed to visual art particular movies right you're very hard pressed to find a, uh, a a student who hasn't seen a lot of movies, or at least been exposed to screens, and so they think they primarily think in images. Whereas in, in literature or fiction, um, it's the, the the matter, right? The material is language primarily. Whereas in screenwriting, it is it, language plays a role, but we are developing a story that is only actualized on the screen. Sure. And because you know they. Um, they're young, they have not made films. It's hard for them to conceptualize what it would look like if this would this was made in a movie. And uh, uh, so while we read stories and literature and when fiction class in screenwriting, I show them a lot of films. Yeah, my my uh, yeah. Yeah. my 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 professor at NYU, because I went to film school at NYU, um, 
my my professor always told me this one little thing that stuck with me and it's been said a million times but it's very, like you said it's a conceptually very difficult to grasp is that when you're writing a script you have to pretend that you're able to tell the story with the sound off you know yeah. that like everything that you're writing is important to pushing the story forward without the necessity of dialogue or sound yes and yeah, so it's, it's the only what is can be seen should be in the script yeah 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 no no that's uh that's very interesting and um do you um um have uh other screenwriting projects that you're kind of midst you know production on is there anything coming up no i mean we work on a, on a couple of spec projects um a, a possible film and some a tv show and i i have a script that i hadn't worked on a little bit of a solo script um it, which is in bosnian oh nice but I, I haven't returned it for a while because no one, it's a spec script, no one's waiting, and I have all these other projects running there. Yeah, I yeah. Work, I'm making music and producing videos. Yeah, tell me a little bit about the music. I also love to make music. Um, I've been making music since 1997, and me and my, you know, me and my band love the music, and that's about as far as it goes. You know, like nobody else, you know, really, you know, listens to it. Um, but, but you know, we have the albums up on Spotify, so like I, I understand. That What's passion. the name of the band? I'll look it up. It's it's called Ron Revog, R O N space R E V O G. It's the word governor spelled backwards. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'll yeah. Because like when I was a kid, like there was this one interview John Lennon gave where he used to say that he used to walk down the street and like look at signs and read them backwards in his head. It was like this kind of thing that he would do. And I noticed that I would do the same exact thing, you know. So I took the word governor and spun it backwards. Anyway, I, I love making music. I play guitar every single day of my life. It's like how I relax. Do you play guitar? I like, like I've noticed a bass and a guitar back there. Yes, I have a keyboard around there too. Well, my story is a little different because I took about a 30 year break from doing music because I used to have a band in the late eighties and I sold the guitar when I was coming in the, the amp when I was coming to the United States. And then kind of just had a, an acoustic guitar play would play the Beatles songs to my kids and such. Right. But then within a week of the pandemic being declared and Princeton dismissing students, I bought a guitar and an amp and some pedals. Oh, wow. Because I rec I understood somehow it's going to last for a long time. I'm not going to going to go crazy and I should play some music. And moreover, I could actually return to it because this is an opportunity because yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, my my author career was canceled, but just like everyone else, no touring, no lectures, no readings, no interviews, none of that. It was sure. an ocean of time ahead of me. So I got to it, and then I pretty soon I wanted to record music. So I I um, started using Logic Pro, and you know, got a MIDI keyboard, and figure out how to use Logic. And so, in this office, I produced almost two hours of music. Oh, that's um, excellent. In the past, you know, 18, 18 months or so, and started releasing it under the name of Cielo or Cielo Hemo, depending the language you're using to pronounce it. And uh, and it's it's exactly that. It works differently than uh, writing, mm. let alone screenwriting, because it could be immediately experienced, right? It, that, once you make it, it's made. Yeah, so yeah, that, yeah. So the book has to be published and all that, and and people have to read it, and then with some delay they'll tell you what they think about it. And the script, you write it, and then it takes two, three years to make if if it works at all, right? Yeah, yeah. You're lucky for the movie to be made. But I make the songs, I send them to my friends instantly, and they instantly react. And I had in that footage from um, the, the the video, right? Some of the people, that, those people dancing, are friends, uh, Lana and Tom Tickwer and other friends in Berlin. And some of those shots are from they're dancing to my music that I made. And so oh, that's it's responded to my music. That that in itself is joy and love. And so this immediacy of of music is is extremely valuable to me. And it all works, you know, in um uh, reflectively as the word. That is, I dance to my own music. Right? Absolutely, I absolutely. It. I made this music and I can dance and other people can dance and I'm looking for ways to make other people dance and react to it. Yeah, I, I love that. I have a similar experience with music during the pandemic because I've been playing guitar, you know, for 20 years, but I sucked for 20 years. And, <laughs> you know, during the pandemic, I was like, I made, we made an album with my band that was called Echo Chamber. 
which was talking a little bit about all the stuff that was going on at the time with the election and all, you know, like typical rock and roll, like venting stuff, yeah. you know? Um, but I noticed that I'm the worst guy in the band, you know? And like my, my other bandmates are so good that they've been carrying me my whole life. So I, I, I decided to learn how to play uh, the guitar for real and like learn scales and learn, you know, yeah. uh, modes and, you know, understand the seven modes and understand uh, why, how to make a scale out of anything. And, and it's amazing how much you start to unlock of, of, of music once you start digging into it. And like now my favorite thing to do is just put on any music and just improvise with it, you yes. know, and, and have this dialogue that's so that it feels like it's coming from a place that it, it, it is not something that you're super conscious of, you know? Um, yeah. Music is very powerful. Music. Is Absolutely. Very powerful. I did the same thing. I'm producing music and I'm taking music theory classes because I want to know more. I, and this is what happens, right? If you, if you do things, you realize what you don't know while you're doing them, right? This yeah. is the yeah, what, upside and downside of doing things. If you don't know, don't do things, you can pontificate and say, oh, I know everything about this, but you never do it. But what, doing exposes you. One thing that I would recommend um, if you're getting into the whole keyboard thing is there's a company called Native Instruments that makes a keyboard called the Complete Control uh -huh. um, that actually lights up um, so that you can pre-program different scales and different modes and, and different, like, um, you know, scales, right? So that you can pretty much play in key with all kinds of stuff. And it's actually a very, very powerful compositional tool. I've um, seen it. It's, it looks amazing. I've seen it. I, they send me, you know, algorithms send me those. Yeah. <laughs> They'll probably it. send it to you even more now because we just said it. Somehow they're <laughs> they're tracking even this. But oh no, this has been awesome, man. This has been awesome. Um, I uh, yeah, Sasha, thank you so much for uh, for for giving me. Like, I know we went a little bit long here, but I uh, really appreciate you giving me a little bit of your insight um, and sharing some time with me. Um, is there anything else that you wanna you know that you wanna add? No, thank you. I, I very much enjoyed that. Thank you for enthusiasm and thank you for inviting me to speak. I, I enjoyed this conversation very much. Absolutely, man. And good luck on your music. And I'm going to send you some links uh, via email. I'm going to send you some links to, you know, to my tunes. And Please, yes, thank you pe so much. Pe people like us that aren't famous musicians, we need to build our own countercultural yeah. networks to share <laughs> our music. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. I'll, I'll send you a couple of more tracks from me. Awesome. So uh, this is Sasha Heyman, uh, professor at Princeton University, author. The Lazarus Project is, is a very, very, very cool book. Um, so cool that I got the Wachowskis to bring him in into Sense8, uh, co-writer of um, The Matrix um, Resurrections. God, did I get that right? It is called yeah. Resurrections, right? Yes. Yeah, is. sorry about that. <laughs> sorry about that. But. No, it, it is. You got it right. Awesome. Awesome. So thank you so much. Thank you to everybody listening. And I will speak to you guys soon. Take care.